Good evening, everyone. Um, we'll make a start. Um, just to um, let you know, tonight's um, pr presentation is being recorded. Um, and so after tonight, we will um, upload it onto the YouTube, school YouTube channel, so you'll be able to watch it back if you have to dip away at any point um, or want to watch it again um, if you wanted to. Um, during this evening, then, I will be joined by Mr. Allen and Mrs. Tinney at various points um, who will be able to answer some questions. Um, the chat function is enabled, so if you would like to um, put, and have any questions, if you could pop those in the chat and we'll get to them at the end, that would be um, fantastic. So um, to make a start then, um, welcome to the Choices at 18 evening that we run each year for Year 12. I'm going to turn my camera on. Um, which we run for Year 12, which hopefully will give you some information um, and advice about how the UCAS process and other things work over the next kind of 12 months for your daughter. Um, where my thing stops working. Um, so the structure of this evening, um, it's mainly focused on UCAS and U uh, university applications because um, that is what the majority of our girls do. But I know, having spoken to the girls, that a lot of them are considering gap years. Um, some of them are looking at apprenticeships um, and maybe uh, working. So there's lots of different kind of, hopefully some takeaways that be able to use from this evening. So I'm just going to hand you over to Mr. Allen for a moment, who will explain a little bit about what we've already done so far. Mr. Allen. Thank you very much, Mrs. Parrish. Right. Um, good evening, ladies and gentlemen um, and students as well. I think some of those are joining us as well. Uh, thanks for joining us. So as Mrs. Parrish has just said, um, tonight really is a chance for you to get an awful lot of information um, about the process of applying through UCAS and it is largely um, directed at that particular route, but there are plenty of other routes, as Mrs. Parrish has said, and you'll get information on them all. You will hear from Mrs. Parrish in a bit more detail, as well as um, our Oxbridge and Competitive Courses Coordinator, Mrs. Tinney, for those interested in those routes. Um, before I hand over to Mrs. Parrish, I want to just give you a, a brief update um, as to where we are so far in our journey um, towards post A level decisions, as well as, as what's coming up in the immediate future. Um, so the choice of what to do post A-levels is a very important one, obviously. Um, and here at Richard High School, we do endeavour to start the conversation very early, um, much earlier than a lot of schools, um, aiming to guide students towards considered realistic, but rightly very ambitious applications. And in our last cycle, we received offers from Oxford, Cambridge, a whole range of Russell Group Universities and, and many other institutions in an even larger range of subjects. So we are confident that that approach does work. Um, and as Mrs. Paris said, while not all of our students do so, the majority of our, of our students do apply via UCAS. So it's important that we do help guide students through this. But even for those students that don't end up going down that route, the skills and the attributes they develop by thinking in this way are, are helpful to all. Um, so this term, we've started the conversation in earnest, although I know many of the uh, students have been thinking about this for years and years. Um, we've gone to the UCAS convention in Manchester and we've used our period X sessions to start thinking about how we choose the right course and the right location for individuals. We started to turn our attention towards personal statements um, and what we might want our first, uh, our final personal statement to look like and what we might want it to include. Um, but the important thing for, for students and for you as parents to uh, be aware of is that we have started this process very very early intentionally so and it's allowing us to take time to discuss to change minds um, to rethink to think again to have those conversations that I know you'll be having at home and to really chew over these decisions and ultimately come to decisions that are right for each individual student which would be very very different um, each student has this half term met with Mrs Parrish, our head of UCAS and careers, and we've paired them now with a member of staff that will go on to mentor them through the process of writing their personal statement, as well as working with their subject teachers to put together a reference that truly does reflect them and all of the great things that they've achieved with us and outside of school as well. I will then meet with each individual student to go through their personal statement and finalise their reference before the head finally signs it off. So there are a few hurdles to jump over but it's a very thorough process and very effective one as well so that's where we are on the long journey so far we've only just begun 
but the key thing is that each student knows that they do have the time and space to put together the right application for them. Um, it can be a tense process um, and it is one that has lots of twists and turns, but we are here absolutely to support all the way. Uh, hopefully you'll find this evening answers lots of the questions you have, but do remember that we are always available beyond this event to answer any questions you may have. And with that, I'll hand back to Mrs Parrish. Thank you, Mr Allen. Um, so to get started then, um, I've been talking to the girls over the past kind of couple of weeks about choosing universities and choosing their courses, etc. So really kind of, um, I would like to start by thinking about, well, why, why go to university? Um, a lot of them will want to go because they need that vocational qualification to achieve the career they're looking for, such as dentistry, medicine, etc. It could be that they're thinking about developing those broader thinking skills. And quite a few girls will sit and say, I don't know 100 percent what I want to do. And, and the research that's coming back at the moment in terms of graduate recruitment is that employers um, are looking for a degree. They want to see a degree. They're not really that concerned about what it is in at this stage. Um, obviously, for certain careers, certain um, degrees are important. But for the majority, they just want a degree because it allows them to show those broader thinking skills, time management, etc. So it allows them to develop that independence. Um, or we say to them, there's nobody going to be there to make sure you get out, out of bed and to your lectures at nine o'clock. You've got to do that yourself. Um, give some chance to network, probably make friends for life with the people that they live with or they're on the course with. Gives them some of them some thinking space about the future. If they're not 100 percent sure what they want to do, having a three year um, gap as such to kind of study and get some more skills um, is, is gives them chance to work out exactly what they want to do. We've got a couple of girls, for instance, thinking about law, but they're not 100 percent sure. So we've talked about doing a degree in something else to think about whether it is actually what they want to do law long term. So allows them to broaden their horizons, meet new people. Quite a few of them just are excited about the idea of moving out of Shrewsbury um, and going to big cities. Um, study a subject they enjoy is really important. Um, I talked to them about motivating themselves I say you know you've got to do something that you want to study because it's really important that you are going to enjoy it as well because you have to be motivated um, and it's, it's their money that they're spending at the end of the day and hopefully it should get them a better job upon graduation and allow them to kind of move on with their career paths uh, but it has to be because they want to as well um, and, you know, they want to achieve it. They want to go um, and go and kind of experience the whole university situation. So the two choices they need to make is the first thing is they need to choose a course or a subject and then they choose their university. Quite often they'll do it the other way around. Um, but I always try and say to them to think about what subject they want to study first. So they need to think about why they're choosing that particular subject. And for some of them, they find it quite difficult. You know, if they've not studied law or criminology or sociology or um, medicine or dentistry, you know, they're not 100 percent sure that it's what they want to do. So I say to them, talk to your teachers. Your teachers have got experience of supporting students over a number of years. They will know whether or not it's something that might interest you. Um, think about what they want to do longer term with it. Think about is it something that they're going to enjoy or um, that they think they're going to do well at? Um, think about their A-level subjects. Do they link in? So there's lots of things to think about for them in terms of coming to the decision about what subject they want to study. Sometimes it's worth thinking a little bit outside the box as well, because there are thousands and thousands of courses out there and some of them are slightly different and maybe they don't know they exist but when they find them they think oh this is perfect this is exactly what I want to study so it is worth exploring a little bit outside that you know the standard vanilla courses for instance of like history or biology because they might find something that really interests them I had a student a couple of years ago who we found a course in cancer science at Nottingham University and it suited exactly what she wanted to do. Um, so it's worth looking and investigating some different options than we normally may, might consider. When they come to choosing their university, there's things that um, really matter to them, definitely, such as the location. 
Um, I talk to them about kind of, you know, do they want to be in a city or on a campus? Do they want big city, small city? You know, all of those types of things. Do they want an old university or a large university? Um, for some courses, the Russell Group universities, for instance, are not the best universities. So if they want to do something like digital marketing, um, some of the newer metropolitan universities are actually higher up the um, league tables than the Russell Group. The Russell Group um, are fantastic, they're amazing, but for some of the alternative courses, some of the newer universities are actually, like I say, more highly ranked. Facilities is quite important for some of them. If they're really into their sport, for instance, then it's worth looking at um, the location of the university and the type of university and if it will allow them to continue with their sporting activities. Um, course delivery and assessment, there's so much more information about this now online. And for a student who maybe isn't keen on exams, there are other ways of being assessed now. And a lot of the universities will look at coursework and other types of assessment. It's not all exam based anymore. The cost and financial support is quite important. It depends on where you go. Um, lots of universities have bursaries and scholarships and stuff available for them. So it's worth having a look at. The really important thing is they think about their predicted grades. Quite often we'll get students who come in and they're looking at universities that are above their predicted grades. And we say to them, you know, you've got to be realistic. No harm in having aspirations, absolutely. It's really important that they do, but they've also got to be realistic about what they can achieve. University is so competitive to get in. It's really important that they think about what realistically am I going to achieve within maybe one or two grades? Um, because there is some flexibility from some of the universities, not all of them. Um, but it is worth definitely thinking about the realistic part of their predicted grades. And my favourite is the distance from home. Um, far enough away for your mother to have to phone before popping around for tea, but near enough to come home at weekends. I talk about the Northern Corridor, starting at kind of Liverpool and working across up to Newcastle. That's really popular with our students um, because it's not that far away from home and they can come home if they need to. Um, so it's quite interesting how some of them, that's what is important to them. Others, it's they're not bothered. Um, some sit and they say to me, I don't want to go to Wales. I don't want to go to Scotland. I don't want to go to London or I do want to go to London. So they think about the distance as well. But that's really important to consider. So the location. It's really important at this stage that they think about researching. I say to them, you wouldn't buy a car without test driving it, without reading through all the reviews, etc. You just wouldn't do it really important that they go on open days. We're now back into the situation that open days are happening. After COVID, where everything was virtual and online, it was a nightmare. They can now go to the university and actually experience what it is like. And that is so, so important. I've talked to some of them about how if you can't get to the open day, contact the university and maybe just go and have a look and get a general feel for what the town or the city is like. Go and have a look around. All university campuses are fairly open access, um, so they'd get a really good idea and a kind of a gut reaction in terms of what it's like. There's loads of information out there in terms of reviews on the courses and the universities, and there's loads of chat rooms and everything that they'd be able to have a look at and get some student feedback as well on what the, the um, students, current students think about the, the course and the university. My big thing is value for money. Um, they're going to be paying, I'll talk a bit more about this in a minute, £9,250 per year for their university. And for different subjects, they will get a different amount of teaching time. So, for instance, for the science scientists, they will probably be in the labs, in lectures, nine to five, Monday to Friday, maybe with Wednesday afternoon off for sport. But for someone studying history or English, they may only get a couple of hours of lectures a week because the rest of the time they're expected to be independently studying, reading in the library and, and writing papers. So they need to have a think about that value for money. It's really important. Um, and think about how much teaching time, how much contact time they're going to get, how big are the seminar groups they're going to be in. Looking at the methods of assessment, really important. Like I say, all this information is available on the websites now. So if they particularly like, for instance, coursework, have a look at the different courses um, to see what's there. 
really important that they look really carefully at the course content. So, for instance, in English, it could be the speciality of that university is medieval literature and they don't like medieval literature. So it's worth definitely having a look. And I know talking to students, they've already started looking at individual modules for the universities as they're really starting to deep dive into the content of courses. Um, placements, um, if there's anybody thinking of doing a business course, for instance, I always recommend they look at a sandwich course with the third year out in industry. So how are those um, uh, placements assigned? Where might they be? Will they be paid? How much support do they get from the university to find those placements? If it's they're doing languages, for instance, and they're going to be on a year out, where will they be based? How will the university help them, etc.? It's really important that they also investigate these things. And quite a few of the students have talked about studying abroad. So having a look at what um, procedures and stuff are in place for maybe spending a year, even if they're doing engineering without a language, is there the opportunity to go and spend a year abroad as part of their course? Um, levels of graduate employment, again, fully available on websites. They have to publish it, so it's worth having a look at it to see um, what the levels of graduate employment are like. Um, it does change, I have to say, during the time they're probably at university, different kind of uh, heads of faculty come and go, um, but it is worth looking to see what is there. And I will talk to them in year 13 about using the careers departments at the universities um, because they're there to help and support them in terms of their graduate employment. Accommodation is always a big thing for them. You know, what's there's um, the new accommodation. I'll talk a bit more about that when I talk about finances later on. Um, leisure facilities, it, like I say, if they're really into their sport, they might want to pick up a new sport, for instance, um, or continue with um, something that they already do. So there's lots of opportunities and support systems. What if they have some individual needs? what um, is there available for them to help them so there's lots of things to consider and all this information is fully available on the university's website if you search and look there are uh, there it is really difficult sometimes to find it and if you are struggling please do let me know and i'll do a bit of a dig and see if i can find it for you they're not always the easiest of websites to navigate so entry requirements um, is really important and they need to look in um, some detail at these so most of them will start with entry requirements and they will give either the A-level grades or A-level points, OK, the A-level scores. Some of them, however, will also have some GCSE criteria. And every year um, it's really kind of um, disappointing when a student applies and doesn't get a place because they've not read the small print and find that the GCSE criteria um, haven't been met. We cannot take responsibility for doing that. If you can imagine the number of courses, the number of applications that come across my desk, it is down to the student to make sure they have read individually the, um, the criteria and they make sure if they're looking for a six, for instance, in maths, that they've got that six. It's that's the baseline. If they don't have it, they won't even look any further. So it's really important that they do do a little bit, bit of digging and make sure they've looked, read the criteria. And there may be some additional admissions tests. So the GDST offers some courses um, for um, any student who does have some additional admissions tests. So they do a UCAT and a BMAT, um, medical school interviews, there's an LMAT, and we will support with those students who are doing the Oxbridge um, application and might have some extra admissions tests specific to the subject for those as well. I'll talk a bit more about these courses for GDST uh, later on in the presentation. So all our year 12s have access to Unifrog, which is a one stop shop for destinations. It's an online platform for careers. Um, it doesn't just do UK universities. It does apprenticeships. It does foreign universities. It is a brilliant source of information to help them build that super curricular portfolio, which they need um, extra things to add into their personal statement so they can show their passion for their subject. So there's lots and lots of things um, on Unifrog. Um, it's it's a fantastic resource and it is constantly being updated. So I really would recommend that if you get a chance, if you ask your daughter, she'll be able to show you what is available. They can do shortlists, they can filter for different things like distance from home, um, student satisfaction rates, loads and loads of different things. So it really is a fantastic resource. So there's lots of other sources of information that you can have a look at. Um, there's Discover Uni, um, which is uh, run by the UK government. 
So there's lots of information there. Um, they do um, national student survey and they bring together lots of information and it looks a bit like that when you, you could do a comparison between um, two different universities. You can see here I've done history um, for Bristol and for Durham and it, you can click on those individual buttons and find out more about it. So it'll tell you, as you can see there, just a little bit of a headshot there of, of the different things, but you can look and dig a little bit more into each of the, these um, headings and do a comparison between the two universities. So it's a really useful website and it's run by the government, so hopefully the data is fairly accurate. There is also the Guardian Education Guide, um, which ranks universities um, by combining scores, the aspects of uni university life that matter to students. Normally it's more to do with social things as well. Um, so this they may you know this gives ratings for teaching, um, kind of chances to find a good job when graduating. So it's a lot of different things that maybe the previous website doesn't really cover. Um, and that allows you there to just go into it and you can search and it will bring you up for different subjects, the rankings based on um, those satisfaction um, statistics that they're looking for. There's lots of other websites you can have a look at. There's UCAS and um, some of the students will still have their Morrisby log on. Um, there's OpenDays.com is a great source for any open days. It lists every single university's open day. And UniTaster Days is another good one. And UniTaster Days has lots of webinars and stuff on there as well, which they're welcome to obviously watch. And it's a free access um, service. You don't need to subscribe to any of those. Um, so in school, um, there's lots of support available for them. Um, I am the head of careers and UCAS. Um, I work four days a week. Um, so I have met with most of the students. I've got a few left to see, I'm seeing tomorrow. Um, but most of the students have had their one-to-one -one meetings with me, but they are welcome to come and see me any time they like. And they know they just drop me an email, book an appointment, um, and they get my undivided attention for however long they need it. So there's one-to-one -one meetings um, all the time taking place throughout the year. They don't need to wait for a certain slot. They can come and see me whenever they like. We do have teams groups, um, and I will be setting up their teams um, groups over the next couple of weeks where specific information is posted. So we normally have a medic one, for instance, where as stuff comes through, we post stuff on there about workshops or um, webinars and stuff that's happening. And I send emails to students probably a couple of times a week with various activities such as um, online work experience or other activities um, essay competitions, etc. I email them directly to the whole year group or to specific students if I know what they, they're interested in. We organise lots of events during the year. Um, so at the moment, um, across trust, the heads of careers are working together on a series of events that we're calling Career Star. So I ran one with head, um, the Nottingham Head of Careers a couple of weeks ago, which was a STEM one. Um, and the idea is that we have speakers who will talk about different parts of their careers. Um, I'm having this year, I'm running this series of working lunches, which are happening hopefully about once a month, um, depending on the availability of my speakers. I've had a few issues of booking people and them not being able to make it. So the last one was last week, which was a textiles theme. Um, but I've had a vet who's come in. Um, we had Airbus come in and talk about apprenticeships. Um, so we've had lots of different people. I've got a journalist coming in later in the year. I've got a forensic scientist coming in. So there's lots of different things. And if the girls tell me, you know, I'm really interested in, it'd be great to talk to, you know, a surveyor, then I'll do my best to see if I can find somebody. And I am working on a surveyor at the moment. We also have the Women Mean Business Conferences, which is a series of nine conferences um, that we have been running. We are up to um, number eight is happening in June, and that will have a sport theme. They are available on YouTube, apart from the very first one, which we did in person pre-pandemic, um, which was a business theme. But all the rest of them we have recorded. They've been online and they are available on the YouTube website for school. Um, and you can see there the list of different ones that we've had. Um, I also have um, a series of little kind of 15 minute little videos that I did over the pandemic um, when we were all stuck at home where I did these conversations in the careers corner um, where I spoke to lots of different people about their careers, asked them a set 10 questions um, and they're available for the girls to watch as well. And they cover a really wide range of careers. Um, I tried to find as many different people as I could and there's about 25, 30 of those. 
next May, um, which might be a, it'll be a little bit late really for year 13, um, we will have our Aspire Careers Convention, which is the big careers convention that we organise in the sports hall, where there's universities, employers, et cetera. So it'd be a bit late for, for the current year 12, um, but that did run last year. Um, so that, you know, they will still be able to access it if they want to. The trust courses I've already mentioned with specific things, but there's other events and stuff that the trust organise all the time. And we have our Biomed conference, which took place last October and lecture fest and lots of other things that we run kind of over the year. So there's lots of career um, events happening constantly all the time for them to access. Quite a few of the students have expressed um, an interest in studying overseas. Um, which is, is interesting. I think there's, there's definitely a growth in the interest um, of studying abroad. Um, the key thing is um, to be aware that there is no government funding for available if they want to study outside of the UK. So they will not be able to access a tuition fee loan or a student, um, student loan, student maintenance grant or loan. So it all has to be privately funded. Um, now, there is obviously some benefits to that because the sometimes the tuition fees are a lot cheaper. Um, UK tuition fees are 9,250 a year. Um, over abroad, they could be as little as a thousand pounds or even free, depending on the country that you're looking at. Course content's worth definitely looking at. Um, they structure their courses differently and the delivery might be different. And obviously the student lifestyle would be would be very different to what you would have um, in the UK. There's a couple of organisations there um, which are worth looking at if you are considering or your daughter is considering studying abroad. Um, they're really, really helpful organisations. Um, but I would suggest that due to the nature of the funding and the kind of systems and everything else, that a UK university course with a year abroad might be preferable um, because you will still be able to access all the UK funding um, and you will have that support from the UK university to help you find the placements, etc. Um, there are, like I mentioned, there are specific organisations that can help you if you want to apply to a, student, a university abroad. Um, America is um, really popular, but obviously the costs are quite high. Um, and the way that the universities abroad handle their admissions process is very different. In the UK, we have a central source, which is UCAS, where you can apply to five universities on the same form. You apply overseas, you tend to have to apply to individual universities, so you could be doing multiple applications. So it's worth considering in terms of the kind of workload involved with that. So student finance is really important. I've mentioned a couple of uh, figures there as I've worked through things. So they're going to have to pay for their tuition fees, OK, accommodation if they choose to not live at home, food, books, bills, travel, leisure, all these things they need to factor in when they're working through their budgets. There is financial help available um, for all students. They are all entitled to take out the tuition fee loan. I'll explain a bit more about that. And there is also a maintenance loan. There are bursaries and scholarships available depending on subjects and universities, um, but there's also a maintenance grant which is means tested depending on household income. So where can they get the money from? Um, maintenance grants, um, which is means tested. I'll give you some figures in, in, a, in a couple of slides time. Bursaries, um, overdraft, credit cards. I always say to them, don't get a credit card. It's a nightmare because it's so easy just to keep spending bank loans, sponsorship and other sources. We do talk to them about student bank accounts once they get into year 13 and about shopping around, finding the best one. Um, it depends if they're going to be using the train, whether they want to opt for the one that gives them um, their student rail card free for the three years. There's only one bank allowed to do that each year. Um, I think currently it's Santander, but I could be wrong. Um, so they need to have a look about, you know, decide which one's best. Um, but my advice is have a look at the universities and look what banks are available there so that you're able to check your balances um, and everything or make sure you've got the app so you can check your balances all the time. And don't do like me and choose a, um, a bank that doesn't actually have a branch at your university. So accommodation um, is always a really interesting topic when I talk to the girls. Obviously, it is cheaper to live at home and commute to university, and we do have students that do that. And from here, obviously, we've got Wrexham, Chester, some will commute to Liverpool, some will even look at um, Manchester or Birmingham. So it is that is kind of an option. 
Standards of accommodation can vary greatly. So shared facilities to lovely en suites. Most of the girls I know talk to, they want a double bed with an ensuite. They want kind of, you know, unlimited Wi-Fi. Uh, <clears throat> some want catered, um, some don't want to be catered. It depends. A lot of universities have um, outsourced their accommodation. So they've sent, they've sold the um, university accommodation to private enterprises. They tend to be obviously a lot more cutthroat um, in terms of contracts, et cetera. So it's worth looking really carefully about um, before you sign a contract to make sure that you've read through the small print. Um, obviously, there's catered, non-catered, flats, rooms, et cetera. And they need to think about the distance from their lectures um, to um, their accommodation and have a look at that. Often the universities will ask them to pay a retainer over the holidays um, and some contracts will commit you for almost the year there'll be like 51 um, weeks of the year so it's worth reading really carefully to have a look when students look at accommodation they tend to look at the weekly price and not look at the length of the contract um, accommodation is definitely the biggest expense they will be having um, and normally I talk to them about maybe that is what you ask your parents to pay in terms of your maintenance um, and then you can live depending on how much you get on your um, maintenance grant uh, maintenance loan whatever you you end up with because you know their accommodation can be a huge huge chunk of their their money and I'll, I'll show you some figures in a minute so tuition fees um £9,250. Um, it does depend on the university and the course, but there are very few that don't charge the full amount. Um, they have said that they're capping um, the um, tuition fees for 2023-24, um, and it's going to remain. We don't know what's going to happen in 2025-26. And um, so any students thinking about taking a gap year, it's worth taking that into consideration. I can't see they're going to double them or anything. It will go up by maybe, um, I don't know, 250, 500 pounds a year or something. But we'll wait and see what the government decide. Sandwich placement years, they do still have to pay tuition fees um, because the idea is the university is still responsible for them and they should be having contact with the university and their lecturers. Um, so they will still have to pay a tuition fee and there will be an assessment, for instance, at the end of the year for the universities to be able to count that towards their degree. Um, university in Wales um, is slightly different. Um, it's £9,000 for Welsh universities only. Um, but the key thing is that um, they used to be, the Welsh Assembly used to subsidise tuition fees, um, but now they don't. Um, you have to pay the full amount using your tuition fee loan. Um, some students choose, um, you don't have to pay them, sorry, whilst you're studying. You can take out the loan and then pay it, um, start to pay it back once you've graduated. Um, it's non-means tested, so everybody's entitled to a tuition fee loan. Um, they pay it direct to the university, student loan company, which is always kind of quite a good thing. It never hits their bank account. Um, and they pay it in three instalments over the year, which means that should they decide that they've made the wrong choice, for instance, of university or course, they're not liable for the full year's worth of tuition fees if they, for instance, decide they, you know, at Christmas that they want to leave. They've only they've only paid out the first 25 percent of that year's fees. Um, the key thing in terms of repayments um, is that they begin paying their debt when they earn more than 25,000 a year after graduation from the April after graduation as well, which is down from the, uh, the figure that was 27,295 and it's at 9 percent. So 9 percent of anything over 25,000. I'll show you a bit more in a minute. Um, they've extended, sadly, the length of time that they can be repaying it to 40 years, um, meaning some of them will still be repaying their student debt when they're in their 60s. Um, currently, it is written off after about 30 years. Um, and the key thing is that only 23% of students ever fully repay their student loans. Um, so it's worth that considering that when you're worrying about um, how to actually pay it all back. Um, you can choose to pay their tuition fees um, up front if you prefer, so they don't take out the tuition fee loan. Obviously, that is a personal decision, but um, it's worth considering the opportunity cost um, due to the low interest rate. So if, for instance, you have the money and you want to put it into um, a high interest ISA or something for the three years, um, it's what a friend of mine did. She then waited till they graduated, cashed it in and paid it all off. But she made she actually made some money on it while they were at university. So it's worth having a think about. Um, 
they need to look at each university's prospectus and look at the courses. There's access, access agreements, um, so what they do to help to support students. So in there will be information about bursaries, scholarships, etc. Some, I've mentioned a couple of students we looked and there are NHS bursaries available, for instance, for like occupational therapy. So they'll get some money to help them towards either their accommodation or their tuition fees. Um, and so there's lots of things that are available um, for them. So and there's a huge percentage of money which is never claimed, which students are eligible for and they don't claim. So it is definitely worth investigating and seeing what is available. It's really complicated when you look at the Student Finance um, England website to work out what repayment plan students are going to be on. It took me a while. I've dug. They will be on plan five. OK, so when they are applying, um, if you are an English student who started an undergraduate course anywhere in the UK on or after the 1st of August 2023, which they will be, they will be on plan five. And there's this information. If you look at the Student Finance England website, there's loads of examples and stuff there. So you can see there, for example, the second example, annual income is 33,000 um, each month. You know, you do that. Um, it's over the plan five monthly threshold. Your income um, is £667 over the threshold. That's above the 25. Um, you pay back £60 each month, which is 9% of that 667. There's loads more examples on the Student Finance website. I've just literally picked out two here. But the key thing is, um, as well, is the interest rate will be based on the RPI, the Retail Price Index, which, as we know, sadly, at the moment is quite high. But hopefully, <laughs> fingers crossed, it might start to drop soon. So I just literally looked at a couple of websites. If you dig, you can find this information. It isn't easy to find. They should have on their website an estimate of the um, living costs for the student. So you can see here, University of Liverpool, it's broken it down. This is per month. So they reckon, depending, the biggest thing that, as I mentioned, is their um, accommodation. So they reckon approximate monthly living costs for a student living in Liverpool is between £410 a month up to £1,092 a month, depending mainly on their accommodation and the choices that they make. So Imperial in London is another one that I looked at. And as you can see there, there's a difference there um, of over um, monthly, they reckon £368 to £372. Oh, that's weekly, sorry. Monthly, 1500 to um, 1,579 to 1,597. So there's a big difference, but you get more student loan um, um, for living in London than you do for living outside of London. However, it is very much London based. So for instance, if your daughter considers Reading, Reading does not count as London, even though accommodation will be significantly higher because of the, the proximity to London. So it's worth looking at um, those type of things as well. So maintenance costs, uh, maintenance loans, sorry for living. Um, as you can see here, it's up to. So if they live away from their parents outside of London, they can get up to nine nine thousand nine hundred and seventy eight pounds however that is means uh means tested so it would be very much depend on your household income in terms of how much they will get so when they apply for their student loan um uh, maintenance loan and their student finance um they will be you will be asked to provide information about your income um so they can calculate how much your daughter um is entitled to I'm sorry, this, this slide is, is not very big. This is what is available at the moment. for the So the current year 13s, this is what they will, will be get. There won't be that much of a difference. It should increase, obviously, slightly. So you can see there in terms of how much they will get depending on um, the student loan. I will send these slides out so you can look a little bit more kind of because they I appreciate they are quite small, some of the print. Other sources of income, um, there is this um, a gr um, another form of uh, student finance called the Disabled Students Allowance. It is needs based, not means tested. So any student who has additional needs, dyslexia, dyscalculia, anything like that, they are entitled to um, some extra money from their student loan. Um, if they don't have to pay it back. It is an allowance and it's part of, you know, it's what they're entitled to. So it's really important that um, they do apply for it. And it could be that they say, you know, I need, you know, a better laptop or I need access to different things. So it, it's important they look for it. 
Um, I've mentioned bank overdraft student bank accounts, um, gap year work, scholarships, bursaries. There is a range of GDST awards um, that they can apply for in year 13. So specific ones, for instance, if they're applying for law or if they're applying to certain universities and the girls will get information about that when they're in year 13 that they can apply for. They are highly competitive, but it's definitely worth having a go. Um, it could be up to um, £3,000, for instance, each year during their university. So it's worth definitely having a look at. So these are some websites you can have a look at to find out a lot more. Um, really interesting one. Save the student is, is worth signing up to now in terms of their newsletter because they're always sending you stuff like free, free sausage rolls at Greg's and stuff like that. So it's worth definitely having a look at. And the social media feeds for Student Finance England um, are really useful. So Instagram and YouTube, Student Room, they're great. They, they have lots of information that's posted and they will kind of let, keep you up to date on different things as they change. So there's loads of information available on the internet for you to have a look at. Um, just to mention, the girls that have signed up to Rungway, which is a particular GDST thing. It is um, a great source of information. It's basically a mentoring service using the alumni um, of the GDST and the whole GDST. So the huge kind of library of, of alumni that we have across the whole of the GDST sister schools. Um, and students um, can go onto it and they can post a question anonymously, um, such as, you know, I'm really interested in studying dentistry. Does anybody have any advice on work experience? And the alumna who are on there will then respond um, and it will come up with their name and they can start a conversation. So it's fantastic. It's only available to the GDST students who are in the sixth form. So it's just sixth form based um, and it's a fantastic opportunity. And I really do encourage the girls, if they've got questions, to post them onto the source. And they've all enrolled and got themselves their accounts now. So um, you, know, you might want to have a chat with them about what questions they've been asking. So making their decision. OK, it's really important that they take the time to do their homework at this stage. You know, the, if they make the right choices of the five universities they can apply for, it will pay off. Compile that shortlist um, using the websites and other sources. Check the prospectuses and websites. Go to visit the university. Really, really important. I cannot stress that enough so they can see whether or not they actually do like the university. Um, and I'm very much a believer in gut reaction. It might have the most amazing course but if you get there and you don't like it or for instance we've had parents before who say oh, I don't like it I don't they don't feel safe most universities you know are really keen to stress they are really safe places but it's worth definitely going to have a think about and visit and to put your mind at rest as well as a parent so the decision once they have done their research found their course found their five universities they can complete their UCAS knowing that they are fully informed. And that really helps them in terms of their stress level. And um, that they come and they sit with me and when we go to send it off and they're like, yes, I'm really confident that I've made the right choices. These are the universities I definitely want to attend. Um, we try and encourage them to get their forms off as early as possible in September. We can start sending them from the beginning of term in September. It doesn't matter if they're not an early entrant. So if they're not Oxbridge medics, etc., they can still send their form off as soon as possible in September. And it's really important that we try and work to that. It allows them to focus on their studies. Once it's gone, that's it. There's nothing they can do about it. They've just got to wait to hear from the universities um, and then concentrate on getting the grades, which is what is, is important at the end of the day. Um, early application then, we try and get 90% of them off by the end of November at the very latest. Most of them, hopefully we'll get about 50% of them off before October half term. So sensible choices. So the university will judge principally on their GCSE results because those are externally assessed. Those are already in the bank. So those are already 100 percent guaranteed. So they need to check carefully on those small prints. They need to concentrate on one course um, as much as possible. Um, we can't, for instance, have a personal statement that talks about history and then talks about biomedical sciences. It needs to focus really on one particular course. It's important that they do have an aspirational choice, one that maybe is slightly above their predicted grades. Um, if they want to, they don't have to. Um, and I always talk to students about roll the dice and um, see what happens. Um, you know, if they do desperately want to go to Durham, for instance, and Durham want three A's for geography and they're predicted um, two A's and a B, 
it's worth that conversation in terms of whether or not it's worth applying. They need to definitely make sure they've got two at their forecast grades at least and one possibly below their predicted grade, so a rainy day one. Personal statement. We will start working on that, um, as Mr Allen mentioned, in really in earnest after the May um, half term, with the idea being to get a draft completed before the summer break. Um, it's really daunting. You give people a blank page and say, right, you've got 4,000 characters, including spaces. Tell me why you I should give you a place on this course. And it's really daunting. So they get huge, huge amounts of support, lots of examples to look at, lots of feedback, lots of suggestions. And we will obviously help them to produce the best personal statement they can. And at this point, I'm going to hand over to Mrs Tinney. Are you there, Mrs Tinney? Good evening. Yes, I am. <laughs> Hiding away in the background. Um, Oxbridge, difficult choice, important choice. Very competitive, medicine, dentistry, veterinary science, the same. Again, we are on hand to provide whatever help we can to support your student if that is the choice they make. It's not a choice for everybody. Oxbridge in particular is a very different style of learning, uh, very intense, so they have very short terms, but in those terms you would be involved in a lot of small seminars and individual one-to-one -one or two-to-one based uh, uh, small group sessions so it really is intense there's nowhere to hide if you go to Oxbridge so you have to be prepared to speak out about your subject and as the slide that's showing at the moment suggests doing the research is critical but building on this super curricula not extra curricula it is about your academic studies and being able to demonstrate your long-held interest and that you are reflecting on any experience that you take part in that's going to support your application. So if you go and do some work experience as a medic or a vet, or if you watch webinars that are on your subject, if you're going to study humanities or other subjects, that you reflect on that experience. And when you are writing your personal statement, for which, as you know, we will have lots of one-to-one -one support and you'll be paired up with a member of staff who has got the expertise to support you with your subject choice. Um, so that you get that, you know, personalised um, support for that. That's really important. So they, you get your one to one support with your teacher um, and they will read over. You can be prepared to write many drafts of that personal statement, but they are looking if it's Oxbridge, uh, they are looking for sort of 80 percent academic. 20% possibly less to be truthful on your extracurricular and within that academic uh, offer what you're writing about what you've done in terms of your academic preparation is this super curricular idea that you have delved into your subject you have read around you have reflected on books that you've read you've attended webinars uh, you've gone to in-person lectures and if that feels like hard work to you maybe Oxbridge isn't the place for you it's not for everybody and as with any university, go and visit. With Oxbridge, there's another sort of layer of complication that on top of choosing, and Durham as well actually, and on top of choosing your subject choice, you might want to reflect on what college is going to suit you best. And that again is very personal, uh, well worth looking at the student viewpoint. There are lots of um, alternative perspectives that the students produce and they are definitely worth having a dig into to see what the student voice is. Looking at those student satisfaction surveys and similar things for colleges is a really important idea. When we had a visitor in from St John's College earlier in the year, I did have a chat to him afterwards about college choices and he was, he was of the view, definitely make a choice, don't make an open application because he was telling me that with our background, with the, oh gosh, the analytics that they put in, they would probably come up with girls school and they put you likely towards an all girls college. If that was your choice, that's fine. But a lot of you may feel I probably want to mix things up a bit. I don't want to be in an all girls environment. I want a bit of a change. And if that's the case, make sure that you do make a college choice. So that, again, is another layer of complication for you to think about. So this research, 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 I will just reiterate exactly what Miss Parrish has said. It's a really big investment in money and time and you will need to spend a lot of hours looking around. 
That said, at the moment, your short term has got to be to get the grades that are going to give you access to those courses. So you've got exams coming up post Easter. You need to have a break at Easter, but you also need to be preparing so you can get the best grades possible, which will form part of what bases our decision on UCAS grades, certainly not the whole picture. Um, so super curricular webinars, go and visit. In terms of um, more vocational courses such as dentistry, medicine, veterinary science, you need to be getting as wide a range of work experience as you can. The advice is it doesn't necessarily have to be doing weeks and weeks at one place. It may be better to do many different short term places so you've got opportunity to reflect on the benefits and what you see at each point. But again, it is this reflective process and not just a list of I've done this, I've done that and I've done the other. So what? What have you gained from that? Why does that make you a better candidate than somebody else? Uh, what's, what have you taken from that experience? Uh, through the GDST, there are other things that are open to you. Uh, I was involved and other staff across the GDST are involved in interviewing students from other schools. So you can get one to one interview support in school with people perhaps, you know, but as you develop confidence, we can put that out to the GDST and it may be through teams, etc. that you can access uh, a further practice with someone you don't know. So it's a little bit more realistic um, and that might include using um, online tools if you've got to do say chemistry which is my subject and you need to draw structures and getting practice for that ahead of time is really beneficial anything the girls are at all uh, uncertain of please just pop along and see us and um, we will always give them the time when we can so always just pop along and ask i think that's all i had to say miss parish thank you i've panned you back thank you mrs tinney um, so just to mention that the GDST run an Oxbridge weekend. Um, this year it is in July the 8th and 9th and it will be at Clare College, Cambridge. There is a fee involved, but it is definitely worth going. It's just GDST girls that will be there and it's a great opportunity to experience what it's like being at a Cambridge college, but also to find out a little bit more about the application process and talk to subject specialists within um, that kind of you know situation. Um, they also have access to this GDST Oxbridge on track. Um, it's open to all GDST students. Um, if they are considering Oxbridge, then I would suggest they definitely do sign up to it. Um, and there's regular newsletters that come out once a week with lots of kind of hints and tips and suggestions of things they can do. And as I mentioned, there are these um, higher education courses um, to help them with their preparation for the admissions tests. So um, UCAT and BMAT um, and LNAT, et cetera. LNAT is the law test um, for those of you who are not sure. Um, for any student who is on a bursary um, who is interested in those courses, you are entitled to a free place. So it is definitely worth considering and I would recommend them. Um, they're run by organisations um, that offer them outside of the GDST kind of sphere, um, but they are more expensive um, if you choose to do that one. So there are and there are lots and lots of stuff available to help and support. We normally say practice, 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 do as many past papers as you can, but they will get support in school as well to help them. So um, I've mentioned um, UCAS offers. Some universities, the offer will be in terms of grades. So it may say three A's. Some of them will ask, um, will offer it in terms of points. Um, and you can see there the kind of tariff. Um, and for those students who are doing EPQ, um, which we've still got 25, I think, plus doing EPQ within year 12. Um, some of the universities will include the EPQ in their offer as well. Um, so it's worth having a think and having a look at the different kind of um, criteria. So how do they apply, which is um, always the kind of key thing? It's an online application system. It went online about 20 plus years ago. Um, they are the generation that they are totally online with everything. Um, if I said it's like shopping online. It's all drop down menus. It's really easy to complete. Um, we will get them registered in June. Um, the idea at the moment, we're hoping to do it when they come back after May half term and get them registered. And they will be able to complete um, the first couple of sections, which are data entry and um, before the summer. Um, the system will check that sections have been completed there's a little red star and they have to complete those sections but it doesn't check the data inputted 
I try and kind of make sure that I check everything for them. Um, there's certain things that I focus on. Um, capital letters is one of my big things. Um, and I will check to make sure um, as much as possible that they've got everything in. And I work through the form about four times with the student before it's sent to make sure that, you know, they are happy that they have put everything in correctly. Only once it has been fully completed and paid for, and that is done online with a, a card, um, then we will be able to start the process from our side, which is to get their reference completed. And then, as Mr. Allen mentioned, checked and approved and through uh, Mr. Allen and through the head um, so we can get the application sent. That's normally kind of between a week, maybe a week, couple of days and 10 days. We try and do it as soon as possible to turn it around because it is quite a stressful period of time for them. Um, I sit down with the students um, and send the forms down line for them. And I always talk about, right, well, the university's got it now because it, it's an immediate turnaround. It bounces straight out electronically and they will get emails from the university to say they've received it normally within about five, ten minutes. Um, so it's, it's a really quick turnaround. Then comes the fun and games where we have to wait to hear from the universities. Some universities are really slow at responding. Um, and I always say to the medics and the vets, even though they've got their forms in kind of early, you know, by the 15th of October and um, bless them quite often that we still have medics waiting at the moment um, to hear from their universities as to whether or not they've been accepted. It is a really very long process um, and we do feel for them and obviously we support them as much as we can. So to move on then, a lot of students who are coming to see me at the moment are talking about taking a gap year. Um, which is fantastic. There's lots and lots of opportunities available. Um, some of them say, you know, I'm not ready. I'm not ready to go to university at the end of year 13. I want to kind of do something a bit more. If I don't do it now, when am I ever going to do it? I want to go travelling. Um, I want to do some voluntary work. Um, I'm not sure whether, I'm, whether I should be applying to do that course at the moment. Um, they want to earn some money. They just want to maybe just take a little bit more time before they settle into a, a university course. If you Google gap years, um, you will come up with thousands of organisations um, that offer gap years. Um, it's worth really sifting through them to see what you can find. Um, depending on what they want to do, um, they will find lots again, lots of organisations. Um, look for a project definitely that will enhance their skills. If they're looking to do a particular project, um, look for something that maybe links in with what they're applying for. So for medics, for instance, they can go and do some voluntary work working abroad um, if that's what they want to do, um, working in a clinical setting, for instance, overseas, and that will really help them with their medical application. There is also a scheme called Year in Industry, which is run by EDT, which is the Engineering Development Trust, um, which is useful for any students who are interested, for instance, in STEM subjects. Um, there's a small fee involved, an admin fee, but they will help them um, develop a CV, help them with interview practice, and they will then match that student to employers who will offer a year's, basically a year's paid work experience. There are some fantastic placements through year in industry. It's really worth considering if your daughter is thinking about um, a career, maybe in the STEM subjects. Um, it gives them a year's work experience, um, paid and really well paid. Some of the placements are fantastic, but also it gives them chance to work out before committing to a three year degree, whether, for instance, chemical engineering is what they want to do. So I really would recommend year in industry as a possible alternative for a gap year. Um, need to really think about what do they want to achieve in their gap year? Um, because one of the things if they are applying to uh, definitely to defer their course, um, defer their entry. So when they're applying through UCAS, there is the option to choose to do that from day one. They We will expect them to put in their personal statement a sentence at least about what they're hoping to achieve within their gap year to explain to the university why they want to defer. Um, so they need to think about that. Um, what do they want to take from that experience? What are they hoping to, you know, experience? What are they hoping? What are their aims? What are their objectives? Plan how they're going to finance it um, and budget to make sure they've got enough cash if they're going to go travelling. When are they going to go? How are they going to earn the money to get there? How are they going to survive when they're there? Have they got family out there, friends out there that they can kind of turn to to support them if they're there? And thinking ahead, it's really important that they think ahead about these new skills and experiences. Here's some examples if they want to have a look at um, 
Rally International that hopefully you've all heard of. Um, it's one of the high profile ones, but there's all sorts of different ones that they can have a look at there. Um, for those who are talking about ski season, we do get that quite often. Um, the Orchard House Chalet Cook course um, is a two week course um, for them to take, which um, the ski um, ski season companies really like and rate in terms of um, for them to, to complete, to help them be um, a chalet maid or whatever they want to do. So there's lots of different organisations. This YIP, Yippy Yap at the bottom is a term, tutoring scheme. Um, that means they can live at home and do maybe just a little bit of private tutoring on the side while they may be working in other employment as well. But it's quite a nice way if they decide to do tutoring to show their passion for their subject, for instance. So there's lots and lots of different things you can have a look at there. Um, Apprenticeships is another alternative and some of the students have been talking about that um, because apprenticeships, particularly degree apprenticeships, are um, a big thing at the moment and they're really, really interesting to have a look at. So um, obviously, if you join a degree apprenticeship, you have no student debt because your employer will pay your tuition fees. Um, now, normally you will work alongside doing a degree, so it takes a little bit longer to do your degree. but like I mentioned, your employer pays your tuition fees, you're working, so um, you're able to kind of cover your maintenance costs, your, your, your living costs, so therefore you're not, you don't need to take out that part of the student loan. So you're not going to end up with the student debt at the end of your degree. Um, they're earning a salary immediately, so straight away they're straight into getting some valid work experience um, and it allows them to, to study for those further professional qualifications or degrees paid for by the employer. Um, leading companies love them. They think they're fantastic. <coughs> and it's kind of um, definitely a growth area um, for the big companies um, to, that they, they just really value the, the degree apprenticeship schemes. Um, and more and more companies are kind of tapping into this as a resource. It is possibly more competitive to get a degree apprenticeship than it is to get a place at Oxford or Cambridge. They are incredibly competitive um, if you think about kind of what is needed and the places that are available. Um, after their degree, they're at a similar stage as a graduate. However, they have got four or five years work experience behind them, which puts them slightly ahead of a graduate in terms of employability. Um, so they're really, really valid and, and really competitive. Unifrog, as I've mentioned before, is a fantastic resource and there is a pink apprenticeships button, as you can see there on the screen, that they can click on, which will allow them to search for degree apprenticeships or apprenticeships at level three, which is kind of um, the entry requirement if they want to do, for instance, a business admin apprenticeship or something else. Um, that apprenticeships button is updated every 24 hours, so it is very current and they can filter for different locations and everything. So it's it's a great way of finding out that information. And as you can see there, there are lots of different buttons. There's UK, US universities, European. There's lots of things they can have a look at. Um, it allows them to filter just the same as they do for universities. So they can filter down, um, and I just did here, ones for a travel consultant. I think I was thinking about my holiday at the time. So they can have a look and see the different things that are available. So you can see the different kind of options and stuff and they can filter down again for the distance and all the rest of it. So there's some fantastic school leaver programmes out there um, available. Um, when I'm talking to students, I say the bigger companies tend to plan 12 months in advance. So, um, you know, your, your IBMs, your Touche Rosses, they will start planning their degree apprenticeship recruitment in the September. So at the same time as they're doing UCAS form. Um, some of the smaller local companies, it's about now when they start to think about, do we want an apprentice for September? So it, the process basically goes through the whole year. Um, they can do a degree apprenticeship running parallel to a UCAS application. And quite often I will encourage them to do that. And it could be that the UCAS is the university is the plan B because they'd much rather do a degree apprenticeship. It's definitely worth considering running two applications parallel in terms of keeping their options open. So some key dates for you, um, which is worth kind of, um, I will send this out to you anyway. But so I've mentioned that after May half term, we're going to have an afternoon where we'll get them registered. We'll be doing personal statements, etc. We would like them to have um, a first draft of their personal statement, as we mentioned before the holidays. 
And the idea is, um, and particularly for our early entrants, our students who are working towards that 15th of October deadline. So Oxford, Cambridge, medics, vets, dentists, um, really important that they try and get that first draft of their personal statement 90, 95% of the way there before the summer holidays. Um, when we come back for an early entrant, they have to work towards the end of September to complete their form. It's really important to give us time to get it sent off. I always say the horror story is on the 15th of October, when everybody's trying to submit their forms, the system starts crashing. It can be a nightmare. So we really try not to send them on the 15th of October just to relieve the stress of everybody involved, the students, but also the staff as well, to make sure that um, we can make sure it is submitted well within the deadline. Um, but for other students, the deadline is actually um, the end of January of year 13, but it's definitely worth submitting it before the Christmas holidays if we can. Um, obviously, when they come back after Christmas in year 13, they've got two weeks of exams. They really don't want to be worrying about their UCAS form and getting it all sorted out um, so we can get it sent before the deadline of the 26th of January. At that stage, 26th of January, some universities, not all, will close to applications. Some universities will leave their applications open, but quite a few of the, um, the Russell Group, for instance, will close applications on the 26th of January. So it is worth bearing that in mind. Um, I've mentioned early applicants, um, really important that they're aware of that deadline of the 15th of October. And, you know, we will hopefully keep that communication channels going so we don't get someone coming, for instance, on the 14th of October and saying, I've changed my mind, I'd like to make a, um, a Cambridge application. Not the best. Um, so longer term, um, I talked to the students um, about this time in year 13, so I'll be doing it over the next couple of weeks, about longer term. Um, so it's worth having you look at some of these websites if you want to consider kind of, you know, what where they'll be in the next five years, for instance. There's lots of information here about graduate internships, schemes, um, recruitment, all the rest of it. So there's loads of stuff there that they can have a look at as well. And that sometimes helps them make the decision in terms of what course, for instance, they want to apply for. So has anybody got any questions? Um, so Mrs Tinney um, is available. She's still online to answer any um, early applicant questions or Oxbridge questions. And Mr Allen and I between us will answer any of the other questions that you might well have. A um, couple of things here. So um, these entrance admissions tests, um, it's worth checking with a vet, um, different universities. Most of them have got rid of the admissions test now, but it's worth checking. Um, and just a little bit of information here about for the medics, for instance, UCAT, they take it at the Pearson Test Centre, the driving test centre, basically, and they have to enter independently. BMAT is done at school um, and LNAT is taken again at the driving test centre. So there's, there's being aware about where those tests will need to be taken. Um, and there's some useful guides here as well. I'll send this out to you. Um, I'll probably send it through the girls, but I'll also send it out to parents. So you've got the, all these slides to have a look at. And as I mentioned, this evening is being recorded so you can um, watch it back or screenshot, do different kind of um, links should you want to. So I'm going to turn my camera back on. I'll stop sharing my screen. And Mr. Allen, are you able to turn your um, camera on and Mrs. Tinney? Oh, I haven't got managed to unshare. Stop sharing. There we go. And then we're here to answer any questions that people may have. If you want to pop them into the chat, um, if you do have a question. If he's got any questions. We are available. Um, Obviously, all the time, if you do have a question and you want to specific, you don't want to put it on here, for instance, it might be something of a more personal nature. Please do drop us an email um, and we will do our best to answer questions individually. If you would prefer that, um, that's not a problem at all. And obviously, Mr. Allen and Mrs. Tinney and I will do our best to get back to you as soon as possible. Right. Nobody's putting anything in the chat. <gasps> Hey. Oh, thank you. So on that note, as nobody's asking questions, I'm hopefully um, you've got the information you need. If you want anything else, like I say, 
please do drop us an email. Um, we are here to help you and support you and your daughter as well. So please do just drop us an email and we will do our best to help. But thank you very much for coming. And we will see you again soon. Thank you.